Press two fourteen. And I'm gonna make myself a student, so we're we're looking at the same thing. All right, so you know where to go to find your grades, you know where assignments are located. We don't do discussions, um, quizzes. Uh, we'll have to talk about quizzes. And then uh, everything else is where I put it before in content. And of course, class list, you'll know about that. All right, so let me, let me get back to, here we go. Something recognizable. Table of contents. Let's go start here. Now, okay. So before we get into the syllabus, I'll just point out that I put the schedule. Has anybody been in here yet? Have you looked at the bright space already? Okay, so I don't have to spend a lot of time. You know there's the schedule. Uh, and uh, here's the syllabus and here's my schedule. Of course, that tells you where I am, when I am. And here's the same link to my uh, my Zoom office hours. Right? That's That hasn't changed. Uh, course schedule I looked at, uh, connect with Zoom. These are lab exercises. And we have uh, seven exams. And I'm pretty sure that we don't have a final. No, not enough time for a final. You know, ever since uh, the management decided to chop a whole week out of the schedule, then I just said, okay, I'll just chop out the final. <clears throat> so your last exam, uh, seven, will be in the finals week. All right. So what else do I need to call your attention to? Um, the, uh, the schedule is arranged the same way as, as always. Uh, let me pull it up so we'll be talking about the same thing. Um, and I've highlighted the exams, but I didn't highlight anything else. Well, actually, I forgot to highlight the rest of them. I didn't make that change yet, so I'll fix it. But I did want to point out one thing. Remember last, uh, in the fall, I had to be gone for one of our meetings because New River has a, what they call a, a faculty staff institute, you know, a big face-to-face uh, -face gathering of everybody in the college and it's mandatory. So this is the day I have to be absent on May, March 8th. On that day, um, I'm going to let you take the exam on Brightspace. Right. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm not sure how I'm, how you're going to take the exam, whether it's going to be a PDF file like before or whether I've, I've managed to go far enough to get it into a, um, a Brightspace exam format so that you don't have to do any paperwork. <clears throat> But what I also want you to do is, while I'm absent, go to the videos for Chapter 14 and Chapter 15 and view the videos that are going to be tested, reviewed the next time we meet, and tested in Exam 4. So review those lectures, okay? Uh, and, well, there'll be 14 and 15 in my textbook. There'll be 16 and 17.1 to 17.3 in your book, okay? <clears throat> and, of course, uh, I've scheduled no labs for that day because, as usual, we have an exam that day, so there's no lab. I never have a lab on a day when we have an exam. So that's all you have to do. Just uh, view, as if you were face-to-face, -face, view the video for those that material on acids and bases, in addition to taking the exam. Take the exam first and then view the video. And then when we come back on the 15th, when I come back on the 15th, we'll meet and review chapter 14 and 15. Now, there are there are review documents. And um, what I should do is on Friday, uh, give you all the materials you're going to need for these topics, including the review documents. So, I need to make a note for myself to do that so that you don't have to print anything. You'll have all those copies with you. Okay, that's the only big glitch in the whole schedule. Uh, we only have five labs this, this year. 
and they're all formal. Now, we don't have any informals this time. So what you need to do is, is get yourself a new lab notebook and set it up. You know how to do that. And then, um, let's see. I need to scooch over a little bit to see what, here we go. Um, the only thing we have to do for today in, in in terms of safety is just the safety contract. So you'll have to download that one and, and, and sign it and turn it in when we meet next time. Or I'll tell you what, hold on a second. Uh, let's see. Do I not have it here? Lab exercises. Here we go. Uh, no, I don't have the safety contract. Okay. So what, what I'll do is just, I'll just bring a hard copy next time and you can sign it then. So don't worry about that one. All right. So that's, that's all we were going to do in the lab today. So really all we have left to do since we are all familiar with the way I do things and the way things are set up is just, um, uh, look at, uh, liquids and solids. And then we'll be done. All right. So I'm going to stop this year. Unless you have questions. All right. Are you wanting to, us to watch the video that you have on like YouTube or are you going to do it right now? No, I'm going to do it right now. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do it right now. The only one you have to watch on your own is, uh, is when you get to that date, I'm not here. Acids and bases. Um, let me check something. I want to look at, um, hold on a second. I'm going to make myself, um, instructor again so that I can check out that exam question. Okay. Content. There we go. So let me go down. Let me look at this one first. There we go. Okay. Go to the bottom is where the exams are going to be. Oh, we got crosswords too. Right. So every unit has crosswords, one for each, uh, one for each chapter, I think, uh, except for acids and bases. I think acids and bases, I combined them chapters 14 and 15 of my textbook into one. Uh, here's here's exam. So let me see. Uh, yeah. OK. I did manage to convert this to a lockdown browser. Uh, format. So instead of doing the paper and having to jump through all the hoops to get your, <laughs> to submit your uh, test online, all you have to do is, is take the test using a uh, lockdown browser, which everybody's done that before, right? For other courses. Okay, good. Is it timed? Um, yeah, but I, it doesn't cut you off at the end. Oh, what I have done. Uh, let's see. You probably don't need that. A practice test, because you all know how to operate the equipment, right? Okay, let me do that right now. Let me say, uh, hold on a second. Um, there's the quiz. Uh, that one's, this is the paper quiz. So I just uh, made it, so you won't see that. But let me go in and edit this. Edit, uh, no, that's not, it's the wrong place. I need to go to quizzes. It's only for the first one, for the first exam. So you can see, you can see behind the curtain here. So I'm going to edit it. And I had put a condition in there. This is for, um, for students that have never uh, used Lockdown Browser. And what it does is the, the practice test, which uh, I don't know if any of your other structures have done it, but... Uh, availability. It just tests your equipment and your ability to navigate to get to the exam. So uh, let me delete that condition. Yeah, I think that did it. And save it. Okay. Now, let me go back to content. 
and check it out. Exam one. Okay, so that practice exam, you don't even need to see that. So I think what I'll do is, rather than clutter your desktop with it, I'm going to hide that one so you won't even see it. You may see the, uh, you may see this part, but you won't have anything to do. So uh, just ignore it. Now, when you get to the exam, now all you have to do is click on this, <clears throat> and it'll take you to a page where you would uh, you would start the exam. And if you need an update for your lockdown browser, you have an opportunity to do that there also. So while I'm at it, I'm going to look at the others. Exam two. Exam two. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So are we taking the exams online? Is that why these are on there? We're not doing them on in paper, like on paper anymore in class? Well, no. Um, come to class. Right. Uh, only if you are forced to take them online, this is how you will do it. But if you come to class on those days, you'll take a paper exam and I'll grade it on the spot. OK, that's fine. Okay. I just didn't know because you was on like exam. Yeah, one I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm sort of confusing there. But <laughs> no, exam yeah. three is the one that you will have to take in Brightspace because I won't be there. OK, I was just making sure. <laughs> but the others, um, they're available if you uh, find yourself uh, stuck in the mud somewhere and you can't get to class and you need to take the exam online, then we'll have this available. Okay, that's what um, I'm wondering. Okay, that one is uh, lockdown browser. Okay, good. Let me see. Three should be also. Uh, yep, there it is. Uh, I'm just going to check them all while we're here to see if they're all available if you need to take them that way. Yep, good deal. Uh, notice also that if you take them in a uh, lockdown browser, you will need the the um, useful information that's normally printed at the last of every page exam, right? So I had to put it out here. And what you need to do is before you go in, if you take the exam in lockdown browser, you need to print a copy of the useful information first because the lockdown browser is going to prevent you from, from doing that. So make sure you have a copy of that before you uh, start the test, before you go into lockdown browser. Okay, so which one is this? Four and five. I couldn't remember if I had made the conversion for all of them, so that's why I'm checking them now. Yeah, there it is, good. Six. Six. Uh, there it is right there. Okay, good. And seven should be good. Uh, Sam, seven. Yeah. So uh, you have, you don't have to take paper exams at home and submit them online like we did last semester. Now you can do it in lockdown browser if that becomes necessary. And like I said, every every unit has crossword puzzles as extra credit. And then these exams also have built in bonus questions there. Now, some of them, if you have to present your work, right, show me your work. I've set up the exam. So at the very end, when you when you submit it, it's going to come up and say, um, show me your work. So you just take your scratch paper. Uh, and hopefully you'll have the number of the problem on the side so I can tell which one belongs to which, right? Uh, be kind and hold it up so you can take a picture of it. And then when I look at it in the, in the respondents monitor, it will show me that you did your work and uh, for the bonus questions and I can give you credit for them. Okay, so uh, I don't think of anything else that is pressing. We can we can get on to the lecture now. So I'm going to stop that share. Let's see, we got 84 slides, so we ought to be able to cover those in the time remaining and have time to spare. Slideshow. There we go. Liquids and solids. <clears throat> it sounds like. <laughs> ah. 
it sounds like we're going backwards. Right? right? We've already been through some some pretty uh, hair-raising chemistries already, especially when we get to kinetics, remember? Did we do kinetics already? Oh, no. Kinetics is coming. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, it's like we're going backwards when we talk about liquids and solids. But there is a lot of chemistry that goes on uh, within liquids and solids that can help us understand uh, how and why things happen. <clears throat> so the focus on liquid-solid interaction is going to be on uh, intermolecular bonding. What happens between molecules? And uh, obviously, the Greek prefix here, uh, intra, means internal. So those intramolecular bondings are what we normally think of as bonds between atoms in a molecule. And um, we're going to, we're going to kind of jump back and forth between uh, covalently bound compounds, which are molecules, and ionically bound compounds, which are uh, ionic matrices, crystal structure. Right? We're going to get both of them. But when we talk about uh, intramolecular bonding, we're actually talking about covalent bonding in molecules, like the water molecule, like carbon dioxide, like all of those non-metal, non-metal uh, bonds. So you, they form molecules. Now we were interested in how do those molecules interact in the liquid and solid format. Right. So the intermolecular equals between. So what's happening between molecules? In order to understand what's happening between molecules, we need to understand uh, electron distribution in the molecule. Is it, is it even? Is it balanced over the molecule? In which case, we have a situation called nonpolar. Nonpolar. Polar is derived from the concept of a magnet, right? A magnet has uh, north and south poles, right? So a polar molecule has slightly positive side and a slightly negative side. And if that's the case, if they are, in fact, polar, then you can get the positive side of one molecule lining up with the negative side of another molecule, and you have an electrostatic attraction. So that, that contributes to the forces between molecules, a large part of the forces between molecules. If they're nonpolar, then there's, there's no positive or negative uh, distribution, and they don't interact using that concept. So when a molecule is polar, we say it has a dipole. Right? A dipole in a molecule, and um, we'll use water for instance. Right, we've done, uh, yes, we did shapes of molecules, right? And we've, and we've talked about polarity already, haven't we? Don't remember? Okay, I'll give you a quick refresher. No, we did. Yeah, because you need, first you need a polar bond, right? So the, the dipole moment on that bond is going to be this direction and that direction. And overall, because it's bent, we have a vector summation of a polar bond uh, that way. So when you look at uh, water molecules, say, we, let's keep it simple, pure water. You got nothing but water molecules. Then you have a slight positive side on this side and a negative side on that side. And if you have other water molecules down here, like that, you're going to form an electrostatic attraction between the two. And the, the strength of that attraction determines whether at what phase the material is in. In other words, at room temperature, water is going to be liquid because of these bonds. They keep the molecules 
held closer together. Whereas at room temperature, nitrogen has no polar component. So uh, it's a gas at room temperature. There's not a, the strength of the bond to hold them together. Okay. So uh, this dipole, uh, dipole, this one has a dipole, that one has a dipole. This dipole to dipole force is a type of uh, interaction that we that we identified by this phrase, dipole-dipole interaction or force. There's a special case of the dipole-dipole called hydrogen bonding. And water exhibits that hydrogen bonding. What you need is hydrogen bonded to a very electronegative atom. And oxygen's a good one. Uh, fluorine is a good one. In fact, I think it tells us. Does it tell us in the next? Uh, no, it doesn't. Shoot. Okay, I left that out of the slide. But usually, if it's oxygen or fluorine or maybe nitrogen, then you can set up this significant dipole that is larger than most dipoles. And that gives you a special case of hydrogen bonding uh, due to the increased dipole strength. And since it's hydrogen, you know, hydrogen is just a single proton. So these molecules can get really close together because there's no steric interference from a big atom, right? A small atom lets them get closer. And the closer you are, the stronger the bond. So the hydrogen bond is the strongest of the dipole-dipole interactions. Then there's this, this other possibility. Well, before we get to that, you can also have dipole-ion interactions. If you dissolve an ionic compound in water, then the water has the, the dipole and the ions are separate as, as full charges. So the water is going to associate with its uh, oxygen negative side to the cation and its positive hydrogen side to the anions. And you get dipole ion interactions. <clears throat> but if you have a situation where um, you have uh, a nonpolar molecule or a non or, or a uh, uh, a noble gas, for instance, right? It's just a single atom. It can't have a dipole because it's just a single atom. <laughs> but what we what we notice is that as we cool them down, if we pull cool these nonpolar uh, substances down, they still condense. They go from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. So if you take gaseous nitrogen, which is nonpolar, remember, it looks like this. Nonpolar. Well, how can you build up some kind of a force between this nitrogen and its neighbor so that you can condense it into a liquid? Right? Well, the only explanation was proposed by a, a chemist, actually a physicist, called London. And the, it's named after him, the London Dispersion Forces. He proposed that, uh, based upon the evidence, if you can condense this gas into a liquid, there has to be some form of intermolecular force holding those model, molecules closer together. We know it can't be dipole because they're nonpolar. So what he suggested was electron density is fluid. In other words, all the electrons in the bonds and in the non-bonding pairs uh, are in constant motion. And for an instant, you may get an instantaneous redistribution of electron density that causes the molecule to be negative on one end, positive on the other. And it only happens for a split seconds. It's very temporary. So 
if you have another nitrogen molecule right next to it, then this influences the other one. If this is negative, it repels electrons and it pushes the electrons away over to this side. Now they're negative. And for that split second, you have a negative positive interaction. And that is the basis of London dispersion forces. And they account for the ability of nitrogen to condense into a liquid or for carbon dioxide gas to condense into a liquid and go all the way down to a solid, right? So if we're at um, uh, negative 78.5 degrees C, carbon dioxide is a solid. And it's based upon London dispersion forces because this is a symmetrical molecule. It's nonpolar. And we have to account for those intermolecular forces, int intermolecular forces. Now, here's a, a very important point. When we consider the strength of the bonds, the intramolecular or the actual uh, bonds that hold the molecule together versus the intermolecular forces that hold individual molecules together or attract them, which one's stronger? Think of this in a practical sense. If the bonds pulling the molecules together are stronger than the bonds holding the molecule together, what would happen? The molecules get ripped <laughs> apart. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, the molecules could not survive. So that simple logic tells us that the, uh, and uh, measurements have confirmed, the forces holding molecules together must be weaker than any of the forces uh, holding the molecule together as a unit. Okay, this is an example of uh, hydrogen bonding. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, we'll move on. All right, so this, this slide uh, answers the question I just asked a minute ago, and there it is. I'm going to leave it long enough to get recorded, and you can read it. And then we'll move on. Okay. So now, when we consider phase changes, gas, liquid, solid, um, it's important to recognize that when these changes occur, uh, if you're going from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a solid, you're actually removing energy from the system so that these forces can uh, be felt by the individual molecules. If you've got too much energy, too much kinetic energy in your molecules, then the weak forces that normally would hold them together aren't strong enough. So that's why gases tend to act as independent players. The, the disruptive forces that we encounter with those, uh, the kinetic energy are just too great and they overcome uh, most of the uh, intermolecular forces that would uh, pull the molecules together. Then as we remove energy and the molecules start to slow down, then some of those forces can take effect and then we get liquids. And then we move more energy, then the forces become dominant, uh, holding the molecules together. So that's just a pretty picture. <laughs> Gas, liquid, solid. Think of it in terms of um, intermolecular forces and the energy that's provided to the system. How is that balanced out? And this is in black and white, what I just told you a minute ago. So I'll leave it there long enough to get recorded and we'll move on. Okay, um, now, typically what you would find 
is that as you go from solid to liquid to gas or in other direction, either way, if you look at the densities of these materials, typically uh, the density of the gas is much, much less than the density of the liquid. All right? Why? Because you've got, um, say, the same volume, but you've got fewer molecules in the volume. Or if you have the same mass that you make a gas out of, it's going to expand into a larger volume. So mass divided by volume is your density. This is going to be very low in density. This is going to be much, much higher. Now, in most cases, the comparison of the density of the solid to the liquid is that the liquid is also going to be slightly less dense. Right? Because we're, we're moving from an ordered crystal structure, so to speak, to a, a disordered. And the, the atoms uh, or molecules move farther apart. Water is an exception. <clears throat> and uh, actually, it's, it's a good exception. Water goes the other way. All right. The solid is less dense than the liquid. So that means the solid or ice will float on water. If it was the other way around, when water froze, it would sink to the bottom of the ocean and stay there. And eventually, the ocean would be completely solid all the way to the top and stay there. It would be a real snowball earth. <coughs> but why does it do that? Why is it different than all the others? Well, the reason it's different is because of the way the solid is formed. The solid forms from um, molecules of water arranging in hexagonal structures. So if you've got water molecules here, packed kind of close together, right, and give you a certain density, then when they, when they form into ice, then what they do is they settle into a hexagonal structure like that, right? And you'll say maybe have oxygen here and uh, a hydrogen here and then an oxygen here and the bonding there with the other hydrogen out here and the other hydrogen out here. And it goes all the way around the hexagon like that. What happens is when it forms that hexagon, it tends the molecules spread out, right? And you got this empty space in here that adds volume. So for the same mass of water forming ice, you got a greater volume, which decreases the density. So that's why um, uh, ice is about 90% um, of the density of liquid water. And, that, and the observation in nature is that when you see an iceberg, right? I've never seen one up close. But when you see one in films and say, I like it when they have the, the camera is situated on the surface of the water and you can see above and below. You can see the top of the iceberg and you see the bottom of the iceberg. 90% of the iceberg is below water. 10% is above because of this difference in density. Okay. These dipole-dipole forces um, behave as uh, electric field generators. And we get a we get a, a distribution of, of electric charge that's not complete. They don't form ions. They just uh, the electrons spend more time around the oxygen and less time around the hydrogens. So that gives them. I use that little delta for a slight positive and a slight negative charge. And that, but that difference is enough to allow for electrostatic attractions. And uh, they're typically, uh, the dipole dipoles are about 1% as strong as 
covalent or even ionic bonds. So they're much weaker. And hydrogen bonding is that special case. Uh, oh, I guessed right. Nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. If you have any one of those bound to hydrogen, you have the potential for forming hydrogen bonds among the molecules. London dispersion forces. The One of the important points here is that London dispersion forces are always there. They never leave. The question then is, are they strong enough? Well, if you've got ionic forces or if you have uh, dipole forces available, they are so much stronger that the London dispersion forces are insignificant. They don't matter. <clears throat> but it's important to remember that London dispersion are in all molecules, nonpolar and polar alike. Okay, so when we talk about melting points and boiling points, we find that the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the value for the boiling point and the melting point. Because you've got to overcome stronger attractions among the molecules, you have to put more energy into it. That means the temperature has to be higher. <clears throat> Here's an example of um, uh, hydrides of uh, actually a series of uh, different groups. So here's the carbon group. Here's the nictogens. Here's the halogens. And here's the calcogens. Right? Oxygen and sulfur and selenium and tellurium are in that group. Uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are in this group. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and uh, uh, arsenic and antimony are in the nitrogen group. And then the carbon group has silicon, germanium, and, and tin. What we get is a trend. Um, we would expect the trend, if we follow the trend of carbon, we find that the boiling point increases as the size of the molecule increases. Notice carbon is a small atom, silicon's a bigger atom, germanium's bigger, uh, tin is bigger. So as you increase the size of the molecule, you should increase the boiling point. The reason for that is London dispersion forces. Because the bigger the structure, the, the farther apart the electrons can get to give you that uh, instantaneous difference in charge. So we find that trend also with the noble gases. If we follow uh, neon, argon, uh, krypton, and xenon, and we look at their boiling points, right? The boiling point increases in this direction. Okay? Because as the atom gets bigger, the distribution of electrons can be further apart with much more ease than the smaller atoms can. And the same thing holds for molecules, the bigger the molecule. But <clears throat> the problem is, <clears throat> While the uh, nitrogen group follows that trend once you get to phosphorus and on up, and you get to chlorine and up for the halogens, and sulfur on up for the uh, uh, calcogens, the difference arises when you get to nitrogen, fluorine, and oxygen, because they are all capable of hydrogen bonding. So what that does is it skews the graph so that these have much higher than expected boiling points. Water should be, if it follows the trend, water should be down around here. It should boil at about uh, negative 80 degrees Celsius. Well, it doesn't. Right? If it did, this whole planet would be dry. There would be no water in liquid form on the surface of the Earth. So that explains that trend. <clears throat> All right. Which of these molecules is capable of forming stronger intermolecular forces? Right? It's simple, really. 
which one has the dipole moment available? And hydrogen bonding actually is water. So it's going to form the stronger bonds. And there's your explanation. Nitrogen only has access to London dispersion forces. So they're very, very weak. And with those weak forces, uh, it's no competition for water. Now, the structure also makes a difference. I'm not sure if I showed you guys this one last semester. I, I guess I'll have to repeat myself just to be sure I cover all the bases. But if we have this uh, C2H6O is the molecular formula for the compound. Right? But the structure makes a difference. If we have C2H6O and it's actually this molecule, CH3, CH2, OH, ethanol, then that puts this oxygen and hydrogen out here where we can get hydrogen bonding available. But if we write the molecule a different way, where we have, let's see, yeah, CH3 with an O in the middle and CH3 on the end, we have a nonpolar molecule. There's no, no chance for a dipole or um, well, the only possibility here is London dispersion forces, whereas here it's hydrogen bonding. So with that formula and different structures, you get different boiling points. This has the higher boiling point. This is, this is uh, dimethyl ether, right? It has a very low boiling point, whereas um, ethanol has a higher boiling point. It's like uh, in the 70s, 75 or thereabouts degrees Celsius. Okay. When we ask this question, which gas would behave more ideally at the same conditions of pressure and temperature? Think back to ideal behavior. What does a gas have to be to be ideal? Remember what we said about uh, when we were looking at the kinetic molecular theory. When gases impact one another, what can they not do? They cannot repel or attract, right? They act like billiard balls, right? That's ideal behavior. Well, if they're not going to attract or repel, that means nonpolar molecules would be closer to ideal behavior than polar molecules. Carbon monoxide looks like this, right? It has a dipole moment like that. So, it is slightly polar, and it's less ideal, because when these molecules come into contact with one another, they're going to attract. It may not be much, and it may not be for very long, but it will, be, it will exceed uh, the behavior that we would expect for an ideal gas. So, nitrogen is the more ideal gas. And I'll leave that there for you to read it. Okay. Carrying on. Okay, how about liquids? Well, when we look at liquid behavior, the, the physical behavior of liquids, we find that unlike gases, which are very compressible, liquids are reasonably uh, incompressible. They have very low compressibility. We used to think that uh, that liquids were incompressible. But some can be compressed more than others. And we find that water can be compressed. In other words, we can increase the density of water by putting it under a lot of pressure. And that has been confirmed in nature, actually. We measure the density of water at extreme depths in the ocean at one, two, three miles down we find that the density of water down there is much higher. And even taking into account the salt content, because salt water is more dense than distilled water. Um, liquids also are not rigid. Right? Uh, solids have a shape that they can maintain on their own. Right? Liquids do not. Uh, 
they have a relatively high density compared to gas and slightly less density than the solid of the same material. They exhibit a, a, a property called surface tension. Some have a lot of surface tension, some have very little surface tension. And what we mean by surface tension is it's a resistance of a liquid to an increase in its surface area. If you try to stretch it out into more surface, it's going to resist that move. So how do we see that in practical terms? Well, my first degree was in general biology. And one of the things we, we studied were um, in, in an ecology class, I think it was. No, it was invertebrate zoolo zoology, the spineless creatures. We were studying um, insects and how some insects can walk on water. If you see them called, uh, what do they call them? Striders? You see these insects and they just scooting across the water. Right? Why don't they sink? Because right? we know they're more dense than water. Well, you'll also see if you if they stop, you can see wherever their feet touch the water is a depression. So with their foot, if the water is normally here and their foot lands in the water and it depresses the water like that, what's happening is we're trying to increase the surface area right here, trying to increase the surface area of the water and it's resisting. And the insect uses that resistance, that force of resistance to hold itself up. So that's why you see their feet spread way apart. Because if you put them too close together, that's too much force for the available surface tension. So they spread them way out. Liquids that have large intermolecular forces tend to have high surface tensions. When you look at it this way, the water molecules here, let's let's stick to water. Water molecules here, 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 and here. You've got water molecules underneath <coughs> and distributed all over. <coughs> when they interact with one another, these guys interact in every direction, right? But these guys can only interact that way, that way, and that way. So they have to redistribute their forces uh, in a, a smaller volume of direction. That means that their forces overall at the surface are going to be stronger <laughs> for a given area. That's the origin of surface tension. Surface tension is also the thing that that makes uh, bubbles, when you blow bubbles, makes bubbles round. Because uh, a sphere is the, the very minimum surface area that a substance can occupy. Right? If it if it went into an ellipse or if it went into some other shape, it would be too much. So it minimizes the surface area because of that tension. Another characteristic of liquids is called capillary action. And this is kind of a, an offshoot of surface tension. Because in a narrow tube, you know that if you... Uh, insert a narrow tube into water, the water will rise up a certain distance and then stop. So what's happening is, if we blow it up, uh, we got the surface of water here, and if we start here, then what happens is, there's an attraction between the water molecules and the surface of the, the glass, say, we're using glass. So what it does, it tends to pull the water up. And it's only where there's close association with the glass and the water that it pulls up. Well, it doesn't pull up here very well because there's surface tension pulling in the opposite direction. So that's why the meniscus in uh, for water is convex. But this force, if this force is strong enough, and the tube is small enough, so we narrow it down like that. Then if we use a narrower tube, then we're going to get a rise to a higher level. Because now the surface tension is fighting, is uh, the attraction between 
the walls of the glass and the water are overcoming what little attraction there is in between. Now, that attraction that's pulling the water up has to be balanced by the mass of the water. So it rises to a certain distance until the upward force is balanced by the downward force. And that's why capillaries, the smaller they are, the higher up the uh, liquid will rise. So what you've got is a battle here between cohesive forces and adhesive forces. The adhesive forces are between the liquid and the walls of the capillary. And the cohesive forces are the forces that, the intermolecular forces that attract the molecules together. Now, in the case of mercury, um, the intermolecular forces, the cohesive forces are much, much stronger than the adhesive forces, at least in a glass tube they are. So that's why the meniscus in mercury is convex. Yeah, convex. So the dominant force here is cohesive forces. Whereas with water in a glass tube, the dominant force is adhesive. At least until gravity calls a halt to the movement. We've got another characteristic of liquids called viscosity. Okay, another property of liquids is viscosity. What that measures, viscosity uh, can be expressed and measured in different ways, right? depending on the liquid that you're, you're uh, investigating. But it's still a, an expression, a numerical expression <clears throat> of the resistance of that liquid to flow. So we know uh, water flows very readily at room temperature. Honey slows a lot flow a lot less fast. Uh, ketchup flows eh, okay at room temperature, but when you pull it out of the freezer, you'll notice a little thicker uh, out of the refrigerator. If you put honey in the refrigerator, uh, you can pull it. You can unscrew the cap and turn it upside down. It'll just sit there. It's lost nearly all of its viscosity. 
All right. So uh, there are various ways to measure viscosity. Um, you can use a penetrometer, like you can have your liquid here, and you can uh, drop a pointed object at it, and how deep it goes uh, is a measure of viscosity. You can <clears throat> allow the liquid to drain through a, uh, a hole of a definite size pore, and how long does it take for uh, a certain volume to, to drain through that hole? Or um, actually, you can drop a steel ball into the liquid and say, how long does it take to get from here to a certain depth as it falls, right? And you can use uh, a formula to uh, calculate the, the uh, viscosity in various uh, measurement terms. All right, so the whole host of, actually, uh, you can measure viscosity by a scrape test. You can just put a drop of it and then you can scrape it and how far does it go? On that, on that, no, that's a very simple measure. It's often used in uh, food processing for quality control. Anyway, so what is it that causes viscosity? Well, those intermolecular forces. If those molecular forces are very large, then your liquid is going to be very viscous. Viscosity increases with the size of the intermolecular force. Now, one of the things that we haven't talked about uh, that, that can contribute to uh, this uh, viscosity and intermolecular forces is uh, molecular complexity. And that leads to what, what we describe as entanglement. So if you have very large molecule, well, if you, let's start off with a short molecule. Let's keep it simple. Say it's a carbon backbone, right? If you have a carbon that's maybe, for each one of these, that's a carbon, 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 like that. And other functional groups attached to them, we're not worried about that. It's certain length. But if you have one that's like this, a lot longer, you have the chance for the rotation around those bonds to bring this thing back around this way and form kinks and then it can those kinks can interact with the kinks of other molecules that's what we call entanglement right in in uh, physical in chemical terms entanglement we're not talking about <clears throat> we're not talking about quantum uh, entanglement of uh, uh, atoms right? that's a different topic right so that contributes to viscosity too but what it does is, <clears throat> is when it entangles, it keeps those molecules close together for a longer period of time so that the, uh, the forces that you would normally experience if they were just lined up would be prolonged. That increases the time uh, factor for the interaction of those intermolecular forces while they're entangled. All right. Now let's talk about different types of solids. They can be roughly divided into two types. There's the amorphous solid, which has no structure whatsoever. I mean, it's still a solid, <clears throat> but it has no repeating units. In other words, it's not regularly structured. You can't detect how it's arranged. <clears throat> is completely chaotic. An example of that is glass. Glass is an amorphous solid. We form it from a liquid. It solidifies. And uh, most glass, I should say, is amorphous solid. There are some glasses, specialty glasses, that are fit into the next category, the crystalline solid. But they're, they're very special. The crystalline solids that are easy to identify, uh, lots of them are minerals, right? like quartz. Right? We could consider quartz a type of glass because quartz is composed of silicon dioxide. <coughs> Excuse me. 
running out of liquid. Amorphous solids, right? In fact, some schools of thought consider glass a uh, a super cooled liquid. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess you would have to be extreme conditions to to make it flow like a liquid would. Anyway, there are amorphous solids with no crystal structure, and then there are crystalline solids with those uh, ordered structures, and they can be subdivided into a base unit that is repeated over and over and over again. We call that the unit cell. So that's where we're going. <clears throat> By definition, the unit cell is the smallest three-dimensional repeating unit in a crystal. Right? If you know the structure of the unit cell, you can describe the whole crystal based upon that unit. That's one way of describing a crystalline solid. Right? There is another way, and they're like two sides of the same coin, and they, they complement one another. But we're going to start off looking at the unit cell. The other is called the closest packing model. And uh, that will complement the unit cell, and there's some interchangeability there. We can say if it's, if it's closest packed this way, then it will be this unit cell. All right, first off, we're going to look at uh, unit cells. And what we have here is three different representations of the same unit cell, depending on whether it's reality. This is the space filling model here, here, and here, right? This is more likely what you would see uh, if you could get down small enough to see the atoms arranged in this uh, unit cell. Or we could say this is a lattice model where we shrink the size of the spheres so that we can actually see their, their relative position to one another in a three-dimensional array. And this is large scale. And then we go down, we take one of these cells and pull it out and, and position it there. This is the unit cell for um, the uh, simple cubic arrangement. The simple cubic arrangement simply puts, right? remember how to draw a cube from grade school? Right, there's a cube. The simple cubic arrangement puts an atom there, 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 there on the top, and then there, 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 and there on the bottom. Now, it's not too common, but it does occur. And one example is polonium metal. Polonium is, let me see if I can find it on the periodic table I'm looking at here. I think polonium is a nasty one. Yeah, polonium is a calcogen. It's in the oxygen group. But it's unstable. So if you get uh, contaminated with polonium, if you especially if you take it internally, it's going to cause some damage. In fact, there have been several instances of um, dissident Russians who got who uh, escaped communist Russia when it was a, a, a USSR, and they turned up dead. Right, and they found after a, a autopsy that they had been poisoned with polonium. Uh, apparently, is, that's one of the favorite KGB poisons. Anyway, that's a simple cubic lattice, uh, cubic cell, unit cell. Then we can have a what's called a body-centered cubic. So a body-centered cubic simply has all six points occupied by an atom. We're keeping this really simple now. We're, we're talking about uh, uh, metals, okay? So we have an atom here, here, all the way around. We have eight of them, right? Eight in that cubic cell. And then we have one in the middle. Right in the middle of the cell. That's body-centered cubic. Okay. Let me do this. Let's draw another cube here.
Let's make this one simple cubic. Let's make this one body centered cubic. Okay. And then let's draw another one over here. And let's make this one the next one face centered cubic. All right. So now we have all of these corners occupied. Plus, we have one on the face there, 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 there. So how many faces does a cube have? It has six, right? Six faces, right? If you roll a dice, you can either get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay. So those are the most common. They're not the only unit cells but they're the most common. Uh, uranium is a body-centered cubic, and gold is a face-centered cubic. All right. Okay. Uh, oh, I have a video. Good. If you could travel within a crystalline solid, you would see the particles, atoms, ions, or molecules arranged in a regular array. Here, the spaces are greatly exaggerated, but in reality, the particles are packed close together. The unit cell of a crystal structure is the smallest portion that defines the structure. Stacking unit cells next to each other in all three directions gives the structure. Many elements and simple compounds have unit cells from the cubic crystal system. Let's examine the three types of cubic unit cells. All cubic unit cells have particles at the corners of a cube. The simple or primitive cubic unit cell has particles at the corners only. In reality, the particles lie as close to each other as possible. Note that the particles touch along the cube edges but not along a diagonal in the face or along a diagonal through the body. By slicing away parts that belong to neighboring unit cells, we see that the actual unit cell consists of portions of the particles. When the cells pack next to each other, in all three dimensions, we obtain the crystal. If we fade the others out, you can see the original group of eight particles within the array and the unit cell within that group. We find the number of particles in one unit cell by combining all the particles' portions. In the simple cubic unit cell, eight corners, each of which is one-eighth of a particle, combine to give one particle. A key feature of a crystal structure is its coordination number, the number of the nearest neighbors surrounding each particle. In a simple cubic array, any given particle has a neighboring particle above, below, to the right, to the left, in front, and in back of it for a total of six nearest neighbors. The body-centered cubic unit cell has a particle at each corner and one in the center, which is colored pink to make it easier to see. With full-size spheres, you can see that the particles don't touch along the edges of the cube but each corner particle does touch the one in the center. The actual unit cell consists of portions of the corner particles and the whole one in the center. Eight-eighths give one particle, and the one in the center gives another for a total of two particles. In this tiny portion of a body-centered cubic array, you can see that any given particle has four nearest neighbors above and four below for a total of eight nearest neighbors. The face-centered cubic unit cell has a particle at each corner and in each face, which are colored yellow here, but none in the center. The corner particles don't touch each other but each corner does touch a particle in the face, and those in the faces touch each other as well. The actual unit cell consists of portions of particles at the corners and in the faces. Eight-eighths at the corners gives one particle, and half a particle in each of six faces gives three more, for a total of four particles. In this tiny portion of a face-centered cubic array, notice that 
a given particle has four nearest neighbors around it, four more above and four more below for a total of 12 nearest neighbors. Stacking spheres shows how the three cubic unit cells arise. Arrange a layer of spheres in horizontal and vertical rows. Note the large diamond-shaped space among the particles. Placing the next layer directly over the first gives a structure based on the simple cubic unit cell. Those larger spaces mean an inefficient use of space. In fact, only 52% of the available volume is actually occupied by spheres. Because of this inefficiency, the simple cubic unit cell is seen rarely in nature. A more efficient stacking occurs if we place the second layer over the spaces formed by the first layer and the third layer over the spaces formed by the second. That simple change leads to 68% of the available volume occupied by the spheres and a structure based on the body-centered cubic unit cell. Many metals, including all the alkali metals, adopt this arrangement. For the most efficient stacking, shift every other row in the first layer so the large diamond-shaped spaces become smaller triangular spaces and place the second layer over them. Then the third layer goes over the holes visible through the first and second layers. In this arrangement, called cubic closest packing, spheres occupy 74% of the volume. Note that it is based on the face-centered cubic unit cell. Many elements, covalent compounds, and, as you'll see in the next two examples, ionic compounds adopt cubic closest packing. Sodium chloride adopts the sodium chloride, or rock salt, structure, as do many other alkali, halides, alkaline earth oxides and sulfides, and other ionic compounds. Picture separate face-centered cubic arrays of chloride ions and sodium ions as they approach and interpenetrate each other. The smaller sodium ions fit in the holes between the larger chloride ions and the NaCl unit cell. Zinc sulfide adopts the zinc blend structure, as do the copper-1 halides and several other compounds. If face-centered cubic arrays of zinc ions and sulfide ions approach and interpenetrate slightly offset from each other, each ion becomes surrounded tetrahedrally by four of the other ions. Note the blinking zinc ion and the four sulfides. You can see the relative positions in this slightly expanded view of the zinc blend unit cell. Okay, <clears throat> so there was uh, some mention of overlap between the unit cell and the, the uh, closest packing models. I want to digress for just a moment. Um, oh, I will point out, I think I have slides on this already, but um, the video made it very plain that the simple cubic cell uh, it accounts for only one atom per unit, whereas the body centered accounts for two atoms per unit and the face centered accounts for four atoms per unit. Now, there was a man <laughs> and his son, they were both, both scientists, and they were working with crystals, and uh, they figured out a way to measure the spacing in a regular crystal structure. They figured out a way to measure the spacing between layers. <laughs> and uh, uh, the result of their work was the Bragg equation. And this is, uh, that's a lambda, and that's a theta, which uh, is a uh, number of degrees, right? It's an angle degrees. 
lambda is a wavelength. And um, n is just an integer, right? And I'll tell you what, what it stands for later. Uh, but what we're after is this d, the distance between the atoms. What they surmised was that when you have a layer of, of atoms, uh, and whatever arrangement they're in, it, does, it doesn't matter for this point, if you, if you fire... Uh, x-rays at them of a particular wavelength right? fire x-rays then what will happen is uh, some of the x-rays will um, bounce off the surface here and some of them will bounce off the surface here and when you look at them with a detector obviously you don't want to look at x-rays but um, what happens is you get uh, constructive and destructive interference uh, those uh, x-rays and at a given angle you will get uh, the maximum constructive interference and that angle depends upon the distance between those two layers right? so that's why this equation is constructed the way it is uh, this is the angle uh, that you uh, actually, it's the angle of, well, the, the law of reflection says the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So the angle is going to be right here, that angle. And then uh, the wavelength, of course, is whatever the wavelength of the x-ray is. And then the n is what we call the order of the spectrum. So what happens is, uh, as you track the, the uh, angle of incidence and it matches the angle of reflection through what you get a series of peaks. And that means that at one angle, you get constructive interference. And then at another angle, you get some more constructive interference, but it's usually weaker. And the higher the number, the weaker the signal. Uh, so, and the distance is uh, the measure, the distance between the atoms. Okay, so what does that tell us? That tells us the spacing of the atoms in their crystal structure. And that can be related to uh, the, uh, the closest packing model or the simple cubic or the other cubic models we can actually do a calculation. Okay, so here's... Uh, oh, okay, so I, I got theta wrong. Theta is this angle right here. Okay, that angle. Um, I use this method myself with uh, soils. Uh, soils, uh, the clay fraction of soil is the very finest particle, and they kind of in plates. So once you isolate the clay from a, a, a sample of soil, um, you suspend it in water, and then you put a drop on a slide, and as it as the, the plates settle, they lay flat against each other, right? And then they, they dry. And once they're dry, you put them in the machine, and you fire x-rays at them and measure their uh, the peaks. At what angle do they occur? And you can deduce from that what type of clay particle it is using this equation okay so uh let's see all right so this phenomenon of constructive and destructive interference that gives you the uh, peaks and, and valleys in the spectrum can be expanded into three dimensions it's it's difficult but it can be done and once you've got your sample in crystal in crystal shape, you fire electrons at it, and the diffraction pattern that you get from it uh, used to be recorded on photographic plates. Uh, now you can use uh, uh, photosensitive uh, electronic detectors. We'll give you this pattern, and that pattern is specific to a certain crystal structure. And you can deduce from that what the crystal structure is for that 
uh, substance. This is the same technique that was used to figure out what is the uh, molecular structure of the DNA molecule, the double helix. All right. So let's get away from that temporarily and look at the different types of crystalline solids that are available. Let's see. Yeah. Um, ionic solids are probably the simplest to understand. In an ionic solid, you have both cations and anions. Like in that video, we saw uh, an example of sodium chloride. So you have sodium ions and chloride ions. Now we know from measurement, and it makes sense, that sodium starts out uh, as a smaller atom than chlorine. They're in the same period. So sodium's way over here, chlorine's over there. Um, uh, let me think a second. If they're neutral, actually, if they're neutral, they get smaller to chlorine. But when you make an ion out of them, like that, then you're removing an electron from the valence shell, and that shrinks the sodium ion down, way down. And with the chlorine, you're adding an electron, so that makes it a lot bigger. And the chlorine and the sodium is a little smaller. So relative to one another, the sodium is small, chlorine is large. And they pack together in a certain lattice structure depending on their ionic characteristics. Right? These are single ions. They pack a certain way. And they're of a certain size. That makes a difference also. Uh, if we tried to elucidate the calcium chloride structure, uh, and there are natural minerals called calcite that occur, and they're, they're an odd shape. They're kind of a rhomboid. If you take a cube, take a cube and hold this constant, and you push this way, and then you push this way, <laughs> you get a calcium chloride crystal, a, a calcite crystal. Okay, so those are ionic solids. Molecular solids uh, don't have ions in them. They have discrete, uh, covalently bonded atoms in molecules. And the molecules arrange, them, arrange themselves in a crystal structure. <coughs> and then you can have atomic solids that we mentioned early on with the unit cells. We were talking about metals. So atomic solids um, have uh, atoms at these lattice points as the, in the structure of the solid. Here are examples, right? Um, here's uh, sodium chloride, which is our ionic solid. Uh, here's ice, which are, is our molecular solid. And here's diamond, which is our, is our um, atomic solid. Now, in this case, the, the bonding between the atoms is covalent. But in some atomic solids, the bonding is of a different nature. Uh, for instance, uh, if we make a solid uh, out of, uh, let's see, what would I, mm, well, any one of the metals, make a solid out of the metals, uh, you need a different system of understanding to, to, to attack the problem of why they bond, right? And, and this course is, it's beyond this course to get there. But you have these three different types of crystalline solids, the atomic, the ionic, and the molecular. And in the uh, atomic solid, they're saying these, this is covalent. Well, yeah, it's covalent if the uh, atoms are non-metals. If they're metals, then we get a different type of bond. What we haven't talked here is called the metallic bond. All right. So we've put this little chart together. This is this comes straight out of my textbook, and your textbook should have something similar to it. Um, I think I pointed this one out because if you have a, um, say, the, the diamond in your uh, engagement ring, is perfect, right? No flaws. 
you're essentially looking at a single molecule. That whole diamond is one molecule because all the atoms are bound together covalently into a single unit. Uh, other types of atomic solids, right? I mentioned the metals. We have a, they call it a delocalized covalent bond. I'm not going to argue with it. Um, I've heard it referred to as a metallic bond, but that's okay. And then, of course, if you have the eight, the group eight, which is uh, noble gases, if they form a solid, then they're held together, together by London dispersion forces only. That's the only possibility. Uh, molecular solids <clears throat> are held together by uh, either London dispersion or dipole-dipole moments. And ionic sources, of course, are uh, the uh, Coulombic forces that, that hold positive and negative charges together. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about this other model, the closest packing model. And we're going to start off using metal atoms because that's the simplest approach. First of all, when we get into this closest packing model, we go back to that video and we use hard spheres. That's the best place to start. It's the simplest. It has the fewest uh, unidentified variables. We have to assume that these metal atoms are not just hard spheres, but they're uniform. All of them are exactly the same. And we're going to pack them in layers. And the video showed you that. Things get packed in layers, right? But we're going to go into more a little more depth here with this video, actually. Now, tune your ears to uh, an Indian accent. Not American Indian, but subcontinent Indian accent. And if you do that, then it will make sense. The three-dimensional modes of packing can be easily understood by dividing the whole process into three steps. Close packing of spheres in one dimension. In one dimension close packing, there is just one way of arranging the spheres. Here, the spheres are arranged in a row touching one another. As a result, each sphere is in contact with two neighboring spheres. Thus, in one-dimensional close packing, the coordination number is 2. Close packing of spheres in two dimension. Close packing structures in two dimension can be generated by stacking rows of one-dimensionally closed pack spheres, one above the other. This can be done in two ways. Square close packing and hexagonal close packing. Square close packing. In this type of packing, the second row of spheres is placed in contact with first row in such a way that the spheres of the second row are placed exactly above the spheres of first row. In such an arrangement, the spheres are aligned horizontally and vertically such that each sphere is in contact with four other spheres. So, the coordination number is 4. If we call the first row as A type row, the second row being exactly same as the first row, so it is also called as A type. If we keep on placing such similar rows one above the other, then such an arrangement is known as AAA type of arrangement or square packing. Hexagonal close packing. In this type of packing of spheres, the second row of spheres is placed in a staggered manner such that the spheres fit in the depressions of the first row. If we call the first row as A type, then 
As the second row is different from the first row, it can be called as B type. Now, if we place a third row above the second row in the similar manner, we will observe that the third row spheres are aligned with those of first layer and each sphere is in contact with six other spheres. So, the coordination number is six. Similarly, on placing the fourth layer, we will observe that the fourth row of spheres are aligned with those of second layer. Hence, this type of arrangement is known as ABAB type of arrangement or hexagonal close packing. If we compare square close packing with hexagonal close packing, we will observe that empty spaces are less in hexagonal close packing than compared to square close packing. Now, what are these empty spaces and what role do they play in packing efficiency? The empty spaces in between the spheres are known as voids. These voids are responsible for decrease in packing efficiency of the solid crystal. More the number of voids, less is the packing efficiency of the crystal. Now, you must be wondering what is meant by packing efficiency. We have discussed about this in later part of the section. Now let us study about close packing in three dimension. Three dimensional close packing from two dimensional square close packed layers. This type of packing is obtained by placing two dimensional square closed packed layer above the first one such that the spheres of the second layer are exactly above the spheres of the first layer. In this arrangement, the spheres of both the layers are perfectly aligned horizontally and vertically. On arranging layers one after the other in this pattern, we will observe that each sphere is in contact with six other spheres. Four from the same layer, one from the layer above and one from the layer below that sphere. So, the coordination number is six. If we call the first layer as A type, and since all the layers are also of the same type, this kind of arrangement is known as AAA type of arrangement. On observing carefully, we will find that this arrangement has generated a simple cubic lattice and its unit cell is primitive cubic unit cell. Dimensional close packing from two dimensional hexagonal closed pack layers. The three dimensional hexagonal closed pack structure can be obtained by placing two dimensional hexagonal structures one layer above the other. Placing second layer over the first layer. Let us take a two dimensional hexagonal closed packed layer A. Notice this layer has triangular voids. Place a similar closed packed layer in such a way that the spheres of the second layer are placed in depressions of the first layer. As the spheres of the second layer are aligned differently as compared to the first layer, so let us call this layer as B type. On observing, we will notice that not all the triangular voids of the first layer are covered by the spheres of the second layer. This gives rise to a different arrangement and different voids. Voids There are two types of voids. 
tetrahedron voids denoted by T, octahedron voids denoted by O. Let us study how these voids are formed. When we place a closed packed layer above the depressions of the first layer, we will notice that at some places the triangular voids of the first layer are being covered by the spheres of second layer. At such places, a type of void is formed. This type of void is known as tetrahedral void, T, since a tetrahedron is formed by joining the centers of the four surrounding spheres. While at other places, we will notice that the triangular voids of the first layer coincides with the triangular voids of the second layer such that their triangular shapes do not overlap. At such places, another type of void is formed. This type of void is known as octahedral void O since an octahedron is formed by joining the centers of the six surrounding spheres. Now, in case we need to calculate the number of tetrahedral and octahedral voids in a crystal structure, then just knowing the number of spheres will serve the purpose. Suppose there are n spheres in the crystal structure, then the number of octahedral voids generated is equal to n. The number of tetrahedral voids generated is equal to 2n. Placing third layer over second layer. Now let us place third layer over second layer. Stacking of third layer over second layer can be done in two ways. First, by covering tetrahedral voids. Second, by covering octahedral voids. By covering tetrahedral voids. The tetrahedral voids of the second layer can be covered by placing the spheres of the third layer over them. On doing so, the spheres of the third layer will get exactly aligned with the spheres of the first layer. So, if we can call the first layer as A type and the second layer as B type, then the third layer will also be A type. As the pattern of spheres is repeated alternately in other layers, so this pattern is known as ABAB pattern and the structure formed is known as hexagonal close packed HCP structure. In this type of structure, each sphere is in contact with 12 other spheres, 6 from the same layer, 3 from the bottom layer and 3 from the top layer. So the coordination number is 12. Covering octahedral voids. The octahedral voids of the second layer can be covered by placing the spheres of the third layer over them. On doing so, the spheres of the third layer are not aligned with the spheres of either first layer or second layer. So, if we call the first layer as A type and the second layer as B type, then this third layer will be C type. Now, if we place the fourth layer over the octahedral voids of the third layer, then the sphere gets aligned with the spheres of the first layer. Thus, this pattern is known as ABC ABC type, and the structure formed is known as cubic close packed CCP or face centered cubic. FCC structure. In this type of structure, each sphere 
is in contact with 12 other spheres. 6 from the same layer, 3 from the bottom layer and 3 from the top layer. So, the coordination number is 12. All right. That was a long video, wasn't it? Uh, 12 minutes. I think it was a pretty good description of um, the types of crystal arrangements, the structures that can be observed, and drew some comparisons between um, the uh, unit cell model and the closest packing model. Um, I saw one of them in there that looked like it was, well, they did call attention to the the simple cubic uh, relationship to a, a closest packing. Okay. So what we see is this uh, ABAB type where the, the third layer is positioned over the tetrahedral voids. Gives us this, uh, let's see. Gives us the hexagonal closest packing. Uh, there was also mention of uh, uh, coordination numbers. And don't get too bogged down with that. Since the coordination number is simply an expression of how many other spheres are touching uh, one sphere that you identify. You identify one sphere, how many are touching it. That's all that means. Now, I'm sure there's a way uh, people who work in this area all the time uh, to associate those coordination numbers with various structures. But um, uh, it varies depending on your discipline, actually, what you can do with it. Um, if we if we have the ABCA packing, I think they went as far as say ABC, ABC. ABCA will get you there. Um, the result is this uh, cubic closest packing or face centered cubic. Uh, pardon me a minute. I got to shut up a dog. All right. So this one draws a direct comparison between uh, this type of closest packing, the uh, cubic closest packing with the ABCA and face centered cubic. So if we cut this into a unit cell, we'll find that it produces the face centered cubic uh, product as the as the unit cell. Um, let's see, hexagonal closest packing. You know what? This bothered me the last time I did this. The coordinate coordination number here is 12 for both the hexagonal and the, uh, the cubic closest packing. And the previous one was hexagonal closest packing versus the cubic closest packing. And the, the coordination number for both of them is 12. So what do we get with an ABA? With an ABA, they're saying we get a face-centered cubic unit cell. Okay. If we go to ABCA, then we also get a face-centered cubic. So I'm not sure where the simple cubic, where I can, where I can say the simple cubic is. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, a word about uh, coordination numbers here. I thought we had a simple cubic arrangement that could be, no. Okay, so set that aside for now. So here's your coordination number. Sometimes 
Coordination numbers are also used in um, associations of um, uh, salt solutions, different types of salts associating with water molecules. So this, this idea of coordination number uh, is expansive. It can be, it can work its way into different uh, areas of chemistry. So here we've already covered this topic. The, the number of spheres in a face centered cubic unit. <clears throat> we already determined that to be four or total. And the, let's see, I erased it. The body centered is, is two cube, two spheres and the simple cubic is one. Right. There's simple cubic. There's face centered cubic. Uh, a is there's only one atom if you combine all those parts and the face centered is two uh, excuse me this is face centered is four body centered is missing yeah they dump the body centered body centered is two atoms per uh, unit cell okay so here's a here's a problem Say we identify a metal that crystallizes in a simple cubic structure. It's rare, but for this example, we're, we're saying we have one. What's the relationship between the radius of the metal atom and the length of the edge on the side of the unit cell? Now, why would we want to know that? If you have a uh, simple cubic structure, and you have an atom here in a simple cubic structure and they're only at the corners, then they're going to touch each other like that, right? It's centered on the, on the uh, point of a cube, but they actually touch each other there and they touch each other here, right? right. They're supposed to touch right there. All right, so if we look at the edge of the cube, the radius right here, of that atom and the radius of this atom, if they're the same, then the edge of that cube of the unit cell is two times the radius or the diameter of the atom. Same thing. That's the length on the edge. Now, why would we need to know that? Well, if you're going to say anything about a crystal and its density, then you've got to know not just the mass, you have to know the volume. So if we know the volume of that unit cell, and we know how many atoms are represented by that unit cell, in this case, it's only one, and we know what the atom is, what element it is, then we can determine the mass of that element and its volume, and we can calculate its density, theoretically speaking, and compare it to an experimental value. Right? If we have a face-centered cubic structure, then these two are not going to be touching. You're going to have uh, you're going to have one on the face, right? So they're going to be pushed apart by that one that's on the face. And um, I, I have handouts that describe the geometry of these cells and how to calculate the length of the edge uh, uh, with the uh, with the uh, variable as the radius of the atom. And as it, and if we jump through all those hoops, then we learn that the edge of the face-centered cube is the radius of the atom times the square root of eight. Okay. If we do the same thing with the body-centered cube, then we take that one off the edge and put the the atom in the middle, in the body, then when we calculate the length on the edge of the cube, based upon the radius of the atom, we find it's r times 4 divided by the square root of 3. Okay. So I think all that information is included in, in your review documents and, uh, of course, would be available on the exam.
So now we're going to use that information to calculate the density of silver. Okay, we're told that silver crystallizes in a cubic close packing structure and the unit cell is a face centered cube. Okay, and the edge on the cell is 409 picometers. Okay, so we're actually given the value of the length of that edge. We don't have to calculate it. What's the density of silver metal? Oops. Okay. Here's how we got to that number. There are four silver atoms per unit cell, right? Because it's a face-centered cube. So we know it's got four atoms in the unit cell. So we can calculate the mass that's attributed to that cell with this with this uh, value right here, right? All we need is Avogadro's number and the molar mass of silver, and we can calculate the mass. Now we need the volume. The volume of a unit cell is the distance, D is the distance of uh, on, the, on the edge, the edge distance. So uh, for a cube, you just take one edge and cube it. That's the the volume. So 409 cubic pico, 409 cube picometers. And the calculated that out is 6.84 times 10 to the seventh picometers. Cubic picometers is the volume of that cell. And since density is expressed in grams per cubic centimeter, we need to convert picometers to cubic centimeters. So that's what this has done. And now we're going to calculate mass and put the volume in as we go. So four atoms times 107.9 grams per mole, but you can't cancel anything out there. So what we need is Avogadro's number, right? Which converts the number of atoms to the number of moles, and then the moles cancel. So the atoms cancel, the moles cancel, and give us grams. So that's the grams on that uh, number of atoms. And then we divide by the volume of the cell, and we get 10.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Right. Okay. So, bonding models in metals. Right. This is going to be kind of a, a, a cursory explanation, but hopefully it'll make enough sense so that it'll give you an idea of how metals bond because we never discussed this in the first semester. We just kind of skipped over the metals, uh, unless they were ionic. But if you just have metals, uh, uh, a pure metal, pure substance, a metal, <clears throat> how do they hold together? Because we know they do, because the metals are, are all but mercury, they're solids. So they have to have some type of uh, force holding them together. Well, the first model was the electron C model. Right? And this is what was said. Right? The metals have their, their positive nuclei, and then they have these electrons everywhere. That's the C, the electron C. And, and the, the exchange, the, the Coulombic attraction between the electrons here and that electron with another positive was the thing that held them together. Right? That's a starting point, but it, it didn't explain very much. <clears throat> so along comes the molecular orbital model. And what the molecular orbital model says, as it did in the first semester when we studied it uh, toward the end, is that this whole chunk of metal can be described as an array or a, a, um, a stack of molecular orbitals at different energy levels. And they form bands because there, there are so many electrons that go into this band that the energy gap between the bands is extremely small. So the energy required to migrate from one band to the other is very small. That's why metals are good conductors of electricity and of heat 
because those electrons don't have to jump very far to get from one band to the other. All right. So if you only have two um, atomic orbitals, then you get these molecular orbitals. If you have four, if you have six, if you have a mole of them, it's almost continuously variable if you have that many. All right. So another way to look at these molecular orbitals is uh, those that are the highest field orbitals. All right. The, the um, highest occupied molecular orbital, which is abbreviated HOMO, H-O-M-O. The highest occupied molecular orbital is the HOMO. And then the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, which is just above this, is the LUMO, right? And the jump between the HOMO and the LUMO is very small. <laughs> Okay, so that's just a cursory explanation of how metals bond by an exchange of those electrons and the formation of these molecular orbitals that are very, very, very close together in energy levels. Now we're going to form alloys. Right? We're going to put uh, other things into pure metals. So we have a metal, and we're going to combine it with another metal or another non-metal, or maybe a combination of them. But they can be subdivided into two types of alloys. One is the substitutional alloy. In the substitutional alloy, um, one or more of the metals in the, in the starting material, we would call, say, the solute metal, uh, we remove that atom and replace it with an atom of a different metal. That's a substitutional alloy. And this is typically what happens in metals where the, the size of the metals are close together, right? So you can fit it in there and it won't disrupt the arrangement of the other atoms. The interstitial alloy is one in which all the metal atoms in the lattice stay there and we substitute a smaller atom into, into some of those voids that are created by the closest packing. Uh, a perfect example of that one is steel, where a carbon atom is very small, and we just stick it in those voids. And what it effectively does is it locks the crystal structure, can't move, right? Because there's an atom in that void, and it can't get past it. So that's why steel is harder than iron with uh, a certain amount of carbon in it. All right, here's a, an example of a substitutional alloy with copper and zinc. That's bronze. Uh, copper and nickel would be brass. I think it would probably fit in that same group. And here's the interstitial with steel. So you only need a little bit of carbon to accomplish that locking crystal structure. Um, here's the difference between these two allotropes of carbon. Right? Remember an allotrope. An allotrope is an element, but one allotrope is one arrangement or structure, and an, the other allotrope is a different structure. In this case, we have the um, diamond. In this case, we have graphite. Notice that the, the bonds between all the carbon atoms here are covalent. So it's very hard. It's locked into position. Whereas with graphite, you have layers of hexagonal arrangements of carbon in layers. And the only interaction you have between them are the London dispersion forces. Right? So that's why uh, if you use graphite, you can use graphite as a lubricant. In fact, they call it a dry lubricant. And when I rode motorcycles, we would uh, take uh, a can of graphite and squirt it into our cable traces for our uh, brake and clutch. And it would lubricate those cables without attracting dirt. You know, if you used oil, then it would attract dirt and it'd clog up your cables. So we squirt the graphite in there and it 
causes lubrication because those plates will slide past one another. All right. For diamond, what we find is the difference between the, the HOMO and the LUMO is massive. The distance between those two is huge. So what does that mean about the physical properties of diamond? Well, the physical properties of diamond can be measured. It does not transfer heat very well. It has a very low uh, heat capacity. And they use that, in fact, the um, jeweler will use that with a special device to determine whether your stone is a diamond or not. Because it should have one of the lowest uh, thermal conductivities of all materials, of all gemstones. So they touch that thing to your diamond and it measures the thermal conductivity very low. Uh, and you confirm that it's a diamond. But if you did that to a metal, the metal would absorb lots of that heat. It has a very high thermal conductivity because the distance between the HOMO and the LUMO is very narrow. And it can easily take that energy and distribute it throughout very quickly, whereas the diamond cannot. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, the network atomic solids, of, of which carbon is one, um, and graphite is another. Graphite uh, interacts, uh, maintains its plate uh, structure, covalent plate structure here, uh, as distinct from the next plate. It maintains those structures with overlapping pi bonds. This pi system gives graphite very strong co cohesion within the plate. So the plates hold together very, very strongly. And it does so by making this uh, pi bond system uh, above and below the plate like that. And then the, uh, the bonding between those has to rely upon uh, instantaneous uh, appearance of these uh, weak uh, distributions of electrons to give you positive and negative uh, charges, the, the uh, London dispersion forces. Other types of materials, ceramics. Uh, ceramics are operationally defined. That is, it's a ceramic because we say it is. <laughs> so we define the ceramic based upon its um, physical and sometimes chemical characteristics. So a ceramic is going to be a non-metallic material, which is very strong. It holds up uh, against compressive forces, but shear forces are not good. It is very brittle. So uh, as long as your plate, your, your china or your stoneware plate holds together, uh, very strong as a unit against compressive forces. Right? But if you drop it on the floor, say you have a tile floor and you drop a plate and it hits on an edge, it will shatter. It's brittle. They're very resistant to heat. Right? Ceramics uh, hold up and do not um, conduct heat very well. Uh, that's why the the tiles on the space shuttle and on many rocket systems now, those tiles are very light, but they do not conduct heat very well. So they make very good insulators, uh, insulating materials on the outer skin of the rocket, especially for re-entry. And they're very resistant to attack by chemicals. The bonding structure is such that it holds them together with extreme strength. And the materials used usually do not react with outside aggressive chemicals, like strong acids, strong bases, or, um, well, any number of other materials that, uh, attacking materials that would uh, destroy some things. 
Okay, they're typically made from clays, right? And clays are primarily aluminum and silicon, oxygen compounds of aluminum and silicon. Uh, and they're hardened by firing at high temperature, which rearranges their structure to make these solid networks. Uh, it's called, if you want to look it up, I can't explain it very well, but uh, if you're looking for the reaction that takes place when you fire clays, when you make a, a clay, a cup, right? Uh, if you stick it in a kiln and it's soft to begin with, but when you get finished, it's hard. Uh, cups and plates and things like that. Uh, ceramics, right? The, the art of ceramics is you make your, your, uh, figure or whatever you want to make and then you you maybe you paint it and you stick it in the oven and the firing process causes this reaction to produce a ceramic before it's just a clay now it's a ceramic this is called a pozzolanic reaction if you want to look it up if you don't then forget about it Now, there are other types of solids that we make very, very, uh, uh, a large amount of money <laughs> is poured into and comes out of semiconductors. The semiconductors are based upon um, a pure element of your choosing. Usually, uh, it occurs... Uh, near the border of the metals and nonmetals, right? So silicon is a good example of that. Silicon is right on the border, and we would consider silicon a metalloid because sometimes it acts like a metal, sometimes it acts like a nonmetal. But others have been used, like uh, germanium uh, has been used as a base material. But silicon is used uh, primarily because it's abundant, and it's it's very cheap, and the cost of making pure silicon is where the cost is where the prime the largest amount of input is required because in order to make a semiconductor your base material has to be absolutely pure and uh, I've seen videos of uh, the purification process for making silicon and what they do is they crystallize silicon into these big ingots they're solid, pure silicon ingots, and I see them rising out of the of the uh, the uh, crystal, the solution that they make it from. And they're that big around, and they're about ten or twelve feet long. And then they put them in a, a uh, saw. They saw them and slice them into thin layers. And then that's what they use to build their uh, uh, semiconductor circuits on. Well, well, most semiconductors uh, are made in one of two different types. There's the n-type semiconductor and the p-type semiconductor. The n-type semiconductor is one which, after it's pure, is doped with an element that has one or more electrons more in its valence shell than silicon does. So that would be something from to the right of silicon in the periodic table. So if silicon phosphorus is to the right of silicon, if you dope it with phosphorus, you're making an N-type semiconductor because it has an ele extra electron, which is now mobile. It's not fully mobile as it would be in a metal, but is mobile enough that with the right impetus, you can cause that electron to move. Okay. The p-type semiconductors are doped with atoms that have one or more less or fewer electrons than the base material, silicon. So you would lose something like aluminum to the left of silicon. And what it does is it produces a positive hole in that position. And um, in reality, electrons are still the only things that can move. But to visualize it, we say that the hole moves. 
we have a positive hole there, and the hole moves over here and over here and over here. When in effect, what's happening is when the hole moves, the electron moves in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's how you produce a semiconductor. And a uh, characteristic of the semiconductors is there's uh, a sizable gap between the HOMO and the LUMO, but it's not as great as in um, a, uh, a covalently bound network solid like diamond. It's close enough so that with the right impetus, with the right electrical push, you can move an electron or a hole from one to the other. And what that allows us to do is control the movement of electrons in the device, right? With an insulator or conductor, it's either, it's all or nothing, right? But with a semiconductor, you can control at what point the current moves, right? It gives you much finer control of that. And that's why semiconductors allow for the creation of logic circuits. That is, uh, yes or no, ones or zeros. All right. So this N-type semiconductor has arsenic doped in it. It has the extra electron. This one has boron in it, which has uh, one fewer electrons to form a P-type semiconductor. Okay. Ionic solids now are formed from cations and anions. And they characteristic have very high melting points. Uh, you can melt table salt, but you have to get it really, really hot. And some engineers have actually used liquid sodium chloride to transfer heat from one place to another. That right, is a heat transfer fluid. And it's very efficient to do that. The electrostatic forces between the, at the ions are very, very strong. That's why the melting point is so high. So we can, we can quantify the, uh, the strength of attraction between the cation and the anion based on ideas developed for the attraction of positive and negative charges that have been around for a couple of hundred years. It's based upon how big is the charge and what's the distance between the charges. Because the closer you get the charges together, the stronger the attraction. And the bigger the, the charges, the stronger the attraction. So the attractive force is going to be strongest for uh, multiple charges on the ions. So magnesium 2 plus is a stronger than sodium. And oxygen ion is stronger than chlorine ion in, in terms of force. In addition, since the magnesium ion and the oxygen ions are smaller than their uh, anion cation counterparts in sodium chloride, you can get those charges closer together. So the attractive force is going to be much, much stronger for magnesium oxide uh, versus sodium chloride. So what that says is that the melting point for magnesium oxide should be much, much higher than sodium chloride. All right. All right, we're going we're gonna to go back a little bit to the... Um, the types of voids that can be seen in crystal structures. First, we're going to look at the two-dimensional version, right? These are trigonal holes, right? You have three atoms together, and it produces this, what we call a trigonal hole. Um, uh, and the reason we're doing this is because we're going to, um, we're going to say that these blue spheres are the anions, the negative ions. And then what we want is a trigonal hole or a hole, a void, that's large enough to accommodate the, the cation. That's required for forming an ionic solid, right? So these, uh, the binary ionic crystals 
uh, in the binary ionic crystals, the holes are much too small for the cation. So in the binary ionic crystals, the holes never occur. The tetrahedral holes are formed when a sphere sits on uh, in the dimple of the three spheres forming the triangular hole. So in this case, uh, if we form the the, the tetrahedral hole from sulfur sulfide ions, then we can stick a zinc ion in the middle. It's small enough to fit. If on the other hand, um, we rotate, we take uh, to this uh, this uh, triangular hole, and uh, rather than let's go back. Rather than the tetrahedral, the, tr the trigonal hole, we've got a trigonal hole here and a trigonal hole here. If we just take those triangles and rotate them so that they, they fit down in the, the, the voids between, the, the gaps between the outer atoms, then uh, what we've created is an octahedral hole. Because if we draw lines... Right, a triangle here and a triangle here, and then we connect all of them. How many sides does that um, that trace represent? It has eight sides, which means octahedron. And these octahedral holes are um, associated with hexagonal closest packing. The the that model. So these holes that we're trying to identify, the trigonal holes are the smallest. The tetrahedral holes are the biggest because now we've put something on top and we're closing in a void with that. And that, that ex space expands from just in, in between the three. Now it's got four to deal with. And then if you rotate it, it expands, right? You rotate it, it has to rise up on those neighbors, right? then the octahedral hole is even bigger. Okay, so this, this table just organizes everything we've talked about so far in terms of the types and properties of the solids. So we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, it just organizes things into, into one slide. Now we're going to talk about some characteristics um, of liquids that are influenced by these intermolecular forces. Uh, let's see. Let me look at your labs. Um, freezing point. All right. Okay. Um, just never mind. So when we put a liquid into a container, um, some of the molecules of the liquid have sufficient energy to leave the surface. Right? We know that um, when we measure the temperature of any substance, that's really only an average value for the kinetic energy of the molecules within the substance. So there's, uh, if we looked at the individual kinetic energy of the molecules and the distribution, right? So we have uh, uh, numbers of molecules on this axis, and this is the kinetic energy. Then we know that uh, it usually follows something of a bell curve like this. So most of the molecules have energy in this range, and a few of them have less energy, and they're constantly exchanging it. So this is an averaging effect. And uh, there we go. So what we find is most of them have energy in this range, but some of them have energy over here. And uh, this is often enough energy 
for the atoms or the molecules to exit, to leave the surface and become go from gas to liquid. All right? So when we first put the liquid in the container, we get this evaporation effect. And it's it's one way to begin with, right? Because there's none of it up here in the space. So we've sealed it off. And as we gradually build up atoms in this surface, in this space, we start to get some of them that lose enough energy so that they can impact the surface of the liquid and return. So at some point, we get a, a physical equilibrium set up to where the um, evaporation rate matches the condensation rate. And at that point, we've lost some volume of liquid, but it stops decreasing. So macroscopically, what we see is the liquid decreases in volume to a point and then it stops. Well, if you have a, a device in this cork that can measure the pressure of the gas inside the vessel, you'll find that it will be higher than atmospheric pressure and it's a measurable amount. That's called the vapor pressure. It's, an, it's just the pressure at equilibrium when a liquid is confined in a container. Now, that vapor pressure, let's see. Yeah, this is a graphical explanation. The rate of condensation, the rate of evaporation is the same always, right? It's based upon the temperature. But the rate of condensation gradually increases until it equals the rate of evaporation. And now we have an equilibrium set up. What we notice is that the pressure of the vapor uh, at equilibrium, this vapor pressure, is dependent upon uh, temperature and intermolecular forces. So if the intermolecular forces are weak among the molecules, like they would be with ether, then the vapor pressure will be relatively high at a given temperature. Lots of molecules are able to leave the surface at a given temperature because the forces holding them down are much weaker. Whereas if we take ethanol, for instance, which is the same formula but a different structure, and we measure its vapor pressure at the same temperature, its vapor pressure will be lower because the intermolecular forces holding the ethanol in the liquid phase are much stronger. It has access to hydrogen bonding. So here's a trick question. What's the vapor pressure of water at 100 degrees C? one atmosphere and we're assuming that at 100 degrees Celsius the water is boiling so the vapor pressure at the boiling point is equal to the external uh, atmospheric pressure okay this is another way to represent vapor pressure if we put, if we have nothing up here in our barometer, right, the original design of Torricelli, then at sea level, this column will rise 760 millimeters. But if we do have something up here and not a vacuum anymore, say we have some liquid that is allowed to vaporize and create some pressure then it will apply a little bit of extra pressure that is uh, opposing the atmospheric pressure causing the mercury to rise. So now what we have is 736 millimeters only. So the vapor pressure in the water would be the difference of the vacuum pressure and the one with water, which would be 24 torr. <clears throat> okay. So if we use uh, ethanol, C2H5OH is ethanol, 
then we find that the measured pressure is 695. Uh, compared to 760, that gives us 65 towards the vapor pressure for ethanol. And if we use ether, then uh, the vapor pressure is extreme. It's 215 subtracted from 760. The vapor pressure measured for ether is 545 tor. It's very high. And that's simply based upon the intermolecular forces that are holding the liquid together. If they're weak, you get more of the molecules in the vapor phase and they exert that pressure. I've already mentioned this. Um, this is an example of the effect of vapor pressure, the effect of temperature on vapor pressure. So uh, at sea level, once the vapor pressure reaches 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 torr, you're boiling. Right. So uh, as we increase the temperature, diethyl ether, we're going to reach its boiling point at 35, a uh, little less than 35 degrees. It's going to boil. Ethanol takes a little bit higher temperature, 78. I said 75 earlier, it's really 78. And water, of course, is going to be 100 degrees. All right. Um, one thing we can do is we can calculate the uh, vapor pressure, or we can use the vapor pressure to calculate the heat of vaporization. So the heat of vaporization is dependent upon the phase, the phase change from uh, liquid to gas. There's a certain amount of heat, and we can we can identify that as the enthalpy of vaporization. Right? So, if we put this amount of heat, it will uh, it will cause a mole of liquid to turn to a mole of gas. And if you know the vapor pressure at this temperature, and we use the uh, ideal gas constant, which is probably the one uh, 8.345, the, uh, the one with joules in it. And uh, if we know this constant, which is particular for that material, then we can calculate the vapor pressure. Oops, sorry. Um, and this is all based upon uh, this initial equation, right, which is, uh, oh, who is that? Maybe it tells me on the next page. Uh, Clausius and Clapeyron. This is the Clausius equation, I'm pretty sure. And it was modified to make the calculation much easier. So what we find is, uh, if we if we measure the temperature at, uh, if we have two different temperatures, at least two, and we measure the vapor pressure at those two temperatures, then we can fit it into this equation. So for this temperature, vapor pressure, there's the temperature. And for this vapor pressure at that temperature, here's the temperature. And now it makes it much easier to determine the heat of vaporization. Because all we need is the vapor pressure at two different temperatures, and we can calculate the heat of vaporization for that liquid. And the heat of vaporization for ether is going to be much, much lower than it is for water. Because the heat of vaporization represents the amount of energy required to disrupt those intermolecular forces. And there it is, clausius clapeyron equation. So you may have some uh, problems to work that use this equation, but it should also be in useful information. And I said 345, I said 3145 is the R constant, the uh, ideal gas constant 
joules per k mole. Rather than liter atmospheres per k mole, this is joules per k mole. <coughs> okay, here's an example. If we have the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees is that many torr, and the heat of vaporization at 25 degrees is 43.9, calculate the vapor pressure of water at 65 degrees. And we can do it, right? It's an algebraic equation. If we have all the variables with numbers in them, except for one, in this case, it's going to be the vapor pressure at this temperature, then we can solve for it, right? And if you, if you use that formula and you plug in the numbers, the higher temperature we leave vacant, we put a temperature here, 25 degrees. We put the heat of vaporization there. We put 8.3145 there. We put the... Uh, Oh, we put the temperature here also, excuse me, 65 and 25. Then we put the vapor pressure at 25 degrees here, and this is the unknown. Solve it. And what you get is 194 torr at 65 degrees. And you can you can use do an experiment and measure it, and it will be very close, if not exactly, 194 torr. Okay, now we're talking about phase changes in a sequence. So in this illustration, we have, we're going from ice to liquid water to steam. And what we observe is that as we heat the substance, the temperature rises for ice. And as long as you have only ice, and watch the temperature rising from minus 20 to zero degrees, then when it reaches zero degrees, it starts to melt. And until it's all gone, the temperature will remain constant at zero degrees. So that's why if you mix ice and water together, and you've always got solid ice with water, then the temperature will be constant at zero degrees Celsius. That's for distilled water, of course. So what's going on here? Well, as the temperature rises here, all, what you're doing is you're adding energy to the molecules and they're starting to vibrate and they're vibrating more and more and more, but they're still solid. When you reach the point, zero degrees, then the vibration is sufficient to break the, the intermolecular bonds. And now all the energy that you add doesn't go into increasing the temperature or the kinetic energy. It goes into breaking those bonds and separating them into the liquid phase. So once you've got all of them into the liquid phase, now again, you're adding kinetic energy to the water molecules until you reach 100 degrees. Now, you're not just increasing the kinetic energy of the water. You're increasing it to the point where it can oppose the atmospheric pressure and go from liquid to vapor, liquid to gas, liquid water to steam. And as long as you're adding energy, all that energy is being consumed in escaping the water, the liquid, and making the gas. And it, it will stay there until you've removed all the water. And then it turns into steam. Right. This is the problem that cooks have. If you've got something boiling on the stove and you're making soup, say, or stew or something like that, um, as long as there's water there, it will continue to boil and it won't get hot enough to scorch your food. But once all the water is gone, now the temperature that the, the stove is adding to your uh, soup or stew is increasing the temperature of the solid in that container and eventually reaches the point where you burn it and you're scorching your food. But as long as you've got liquid water in there, then that won't happen. Uh, maybe on a local, right? it might scorch it locally, but what's happened is on that local zone near the pan, you've removed all the water and now the temperature can increase in that local zone 
and that will scorch it also. And it's called a, a microenvironment. Okay. In this case, which would you predict to be larger for a given substance, the heat of vaporization or the heat of fusion? All right, let me explain. The heat of fusion is the amount of heat it takes to uh, convert a, uh, a mole of ice or solid into liquid. That's the heat of fusion. Or does it take more energy to go from liquid to vapor? Well, the answer is the heat of vaporization is much, much larger than the heat of fusion. The heat of fusion, all you have to do is get the molecules far enough apart so that they can slide past one another. And that doesn't take a lot of energy. But when you are taking the liquid molecules and speeding them up to the velocity of a gas, then that takes a lot of energy. So the heat of vaporization should be the highest. Right? I don't put an explanation there, but I just gave it to you. Phase diagrams. Uh, you can learn a lot about uh, phase transitions and intermolecular forces about materials if you construct a phase diagram. So what do we mean by a phase diagram? Well, these are characteristics of the phase diagram, but it doesn't make mean anything unless you see one. So here's an example of carbon dioxide. So in a phase diagram, you have pressure on the y-axis, temperature on the uh, x-axis, increasing from left to right and bottom to top. Okay? So these regions, uh, these lines represent transitions from one phase to another. So if we say uh, phase equilibrium lines is what we're representing here. So if you're on that line at any pressure or temperature at that point, then what you are seeing is there is liquid and gas present at the same time on that under those conditions at that line. Uh, in this case, there's solid and gas present at that. So this would represent a sublimation from solid to gas, or a gas to solid would be a deposition. Or if you go from solid to liquid, this is melting or fusion, if you're going back the other way, right? Under those conditions of temperature and pressure, that's what you get. There's one point in here where they all the lines meet. This is called the triple point. So at exactly that temperature and that pressure, you can have solid, liquid, gas present at exactly the same time. Now, the only other one that stands out is this critical point. So at some point of temperature, usually elevated temperature, elevated pressure, you can, uh, the line, the phase line stops. And what you get out here is a, uh, oh shoot, I forgot what it's called. It's, it's still a fluid, right? It flows, but you don't get a phase difference between liquid and gas. It's like a, it's like a hybrid of sort. It flows, but you can't classify it as either a liquid or a gas. Uh, and this is, um, this is what has uh, blossomed into an industrial uh, product called fl super clu supercritical fluid extraction. So in carbon dioxide, um, this is a good example. Carbon dioxide is often used for this supercritical fluid extraction. So what you have to do is increase the temperature and the pressure to the point where your fluid is out here. 
This is a supercritical fluid. And um, supercritical fluids are characterized by the ability to penetrate membranes. So I'm talking about living systems. Um, in my case, we use supercritical fluid extraction for uh, dead material, right? <laughs> it was uh, uh, usually plant material of some kind. And the nice thing about it is it will penetrate the cells without disrupting them and extract its contents. And then when you release the pressure, you release the pressure, then it comes back down into this region and turns the supercritical fluid into a bona fide gas and the gas can be bled off and what's left behind if you filter it from the, uh, uh, remove the extra extract from the solid material, then what's left behind is the extracted material um, in pristine condition, right? This extraction does very little damage to the molecular structure of the, what's extracted from the plant cell. <clears throat> so it's a very, very uh, mild way of getting everything out of the cell, and then you can work with it. Okay, uh, notice one thing. Usually, the slope between the solid and the liquid, the slope is positive. In other words, um, as we go up in temperature and up in pressure, we get this line to slope to the right. So that means if we go from a solid to a liquid, we can do that at this temperature by simply reducing the pressure. And you can do that with any of them. You can go horizon uh, vertically or horizontally. If we, if we hold the pressure constant, we can increase the temperature to make a liquid. Or if we, down here, if we hold the pressure constant, we can go from a solid to a gas by increasing the temperature. Or we can go from a liquid to a gas here uh, at any temperature by decreasing the pressure. So if we look at, at water, water's different for some reason. The slope of this solid liquid phase line is negative. So that means if you start at a liquid, at any given temperature, if you increase the pressure, you can go from a solid to a liquid by increasing the pressure. If you decrease the pressure, you go back to a solid at that temperature. This was once used as an explanation for why uh, ice skaters could glide across the, the ice with very little friction. It was believed that all your weight pressing down on a very small area increased the pressure against the ice to the point that it created a, a thin liquid layer of water between the blade and the solid ice. And that meant very low friction. But that theory has been disproved. And uh, by, by other experimentation, which is too complex for me anyway, they discovered that this doesn't happen. The pressure is not high enough to cause that transition. And in fact, the thing that allows you to glide across the ice is simply that steel on ice has a very, very, very low coefficient of friction. So you're, you're still gliding on solid. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so concept check. As the intermolecular forces increase, what happens to each of the following? So the intermolecular forces between the molecules is, in, is increasing. It gets greater with new, different molecules, different materials. What happens to their respective boiling points? Well, as the force increases, the boiling point should increase also. It takes more energy to break those bonds. Um, as the force increases, the viscosity increases. It, your, your liquid gets thicker. Right. Uh, as the intermolecular forces increase, the surface tension increases. Right? Resistance to expansion of its area increases. The enthalpy of fusion. How much energy does it take to melt a solid? That also increases. Right? The freezing point. 
the temperature at which the uh, solid turns to liquid right, should also increase as the force holding the molecules together increases. The vapor pressure, on the other hand, as the increase of molecular forces from substance to substance, what you'll see is the vapor pressure will decrease because now you have more force holding that material in the liquid phase and it can't escape as efficiently into the vapor phase. So this is the one that will decrease as intermolecular forces increase. And the heat of vaporization is like the heat of uh, fusion. It will also increase. I don't know who that is. Okay. That's it for chapter 10. My chapter 10. Uh, your chapter 11 and 12, I think, will be where you find all this material in your copy of Brown. So, uh, just to remind you, next time I'll bring hard copies of everything, and uh, I'll also bring uh, a hard copy of the safety contract, and you can sign it on site. So, you really don't have to bring anything, anything completed for the next meeting, right? I'll bring everything with me, uh, assuming that we don't get another whiteout. And next time, what we'll do is we're only scheduled to to have a lecture on properties of solutions, which would be your chapter 13. And then we'll have enough time to do an introduction to the first lab, which is the molecular weight of a uh, of a, a compound by means of freezing point depression. So we'll have to talk about what that means. And we'll get into that in, in the... Uh, discussion of your chapter 13 plus I'll uh, it uh, elaborate during the discussion of the lab that we're going to do the following week okay <laughs>